And some would be chosen to ride the bent horseshoe of sorrow. One quick snap severed them from the fan of roots that anchored them to a darker shore. And I was thinking of wild ones grazing across sunlit fields, free to climb, stretch, and ravel out their flowing roots. Adder's tongue, lupins, mariposas, lean against the wind, seek a lofty slope or washed out culvert. Shooting stars arc and explode in the air, allied to the shine and terror of the field. That song that we did that, they had a couple of manuscripts that I've been working on in well, over a period of years. And the second manuscript that he takes the poems from is uh, titled Epitaph, and it's I've been working in the narrative, and um, because I guess I don't know if it's a series or a cycle of poems, but they all they do relate to each other and they tell a story. The story is briefly of a woman who's, who dies, and in the beginning she's dead, and the story, the story of her life is told in sections of um, a book of pressed flowers, um, a photograph album, a scrapbook. And then most dreams at the end there's a ghost who comes in and talks. And I'm just going to read a couple of poems from this. This one is um, one thing that got into this series of, of poems was um, the woman had um, a twin sister who died at birth. And um, I, I found out a couple years ago that I had a half sister that I didn't know about. And this is kind of in the realm of one of those family secrets. And I found out sort of by accident. My mother was talking about something else, and this kid, she brought this up. This is the first time I heard of it. And I forgot the chronology of how this all worked, but the, I don't know whether it came in after or before or during, but somehow some of this, I think, information got into the poem, whether I knew it and didn't know it or not. But um, I always wanted a sister, and it was quite a shock, not to mention, to, to find that I had a sister, and, and then it sort of just stayed with me for a long time. It's been kind of haunting me ever since, because I don't know how to find this half sister. And um, it was interesting to me that the woman in this story had a twin sister that she had sort of been, uh, who had died, and so she'd been kind of carrying this with her throughout her life, and it affected a lot of things that happened to her. This poem is called Lost Twin. Even that wide gulf of stars can't hold this thirst. These moths that stir the dust on my lids, heavy as the cellar door, where the steps descend into mildew in summer, sealed on the candy shelf. The sun is hot on my braids, the rope scrapes and turns, Burns when I jump in too slow. Lady with the alligator purse, who has seen the wind? Tonight it ruffles the stars in the northern quadrant. Icicles crack all along the gingerbread, shatter on the cold maps of all my dreams. Stars like breadcrumbs are scattered for the lost children to follow, to connect the dots and watch the bear, the archer, the horse, and Gemini, the twins, appear. Rain on dry leaves, I recall her voice rising and falling, pushing the old, old witch into the oven, dropping down Rapunzel's braids. We climb up a winding slide, our small hearts pounding under our pinafores. Empty swings sway in the wind, their chains twist and chime. A path of red leaves loops through the park where old newspapers clock the bare waiting pool's dream. At the merry-go-round, I can almost see a woman with marsalt hair and a big apron. The steam reads her as she stirs with a wooden spoon round and round. The carousel. Two girls jump on, dark braids flying, their faces blurred, then focus as the carousel slows. And I can see they are twins, identical, like a mirror self stepped out, or called in for doubles to the jump rope song. The horses turn and the children spin and blur. Their laughter rises and rings upwards to the crumbling stars. 
The carousel stops and one twin steps off, walks through heavy fog and ticking water drops. Then, singing a jumping rope song, the wind takes her over the frozen stars, like all lost children, to play the pale blue horse and the silver polar bear. I'm going to read from another manuscript that um, it doesn't really have a title yet, but I just finished typing up most of the poems. I've been working on revising them quite a bit. And I've been showing them on a regular, well, not fairly regular basis, to a couple of friends, Roberta Spear and Jean Jansen, who have really been very helpful in getting us some feedback. You have a poetry jam every so often and go over each other's work. Um, I've been asked lots of times who the I is in these poems. And it's a difficult question to answer. Because um, it's a, I, I, I think of it, what I'm really doing is putting what I imagine a novelist works like, which is to create a character, and then the character begins to take on its own life. Um, perhaps something like raising children. You you give birth to children, and they be, and then suddenly you realize that. They have their own independent thoughts of you, and they say and do these things that you can't imagine where they have these ideas. They're nothing like yours. And, uh, and then they find out that they're going off and doing things and, and starting their own lives. And, and uh, it's kind of what these characters begin to do. They're very closely related to me at times. They have many parts of themselves in them, and they have my own experiences, but they begin to do their own thing have their own life. So it's really kind of a mixture of a lot of things. And so the answer is they are and are not in both. Um, the characters in this particular series of poems are part of a dysfunctional family, for lack of a better word. Uh, and um, there's a daughter, the main character, and then she's a sister and a brother. And um, this first poem I'm going to read out of the series is called The Puzzle. Do you remember doing those thousand piece puzzles when you were a kid? We used to do these on our rainy days and just pull out this puzzle. We had one particular one that I remember, and in fact, I think it was the genesis of this poem. It's kind of like a lake with a pond, with these birds that blew up. You know, all of a sudden, pieces missing. So we, you know, my brother got a fight to get all the pieces. And and so we knew that we were going to have races to see who could get the most. So some of that gets into this poem. But it really became, at some point, it went off in its own direction. The Puzzle. Sunday's rain plays old melodies on black shingles. Memories of the mists and mallards drift back from that oval cloth with stained top, where the tick-tick of tap shoes left rhythmical scars. My sister is practicing scales, the rain, the metronome, and the pain. Soup that smooth spills over the battered oak in a thousand pieces. It is early evening, you can tell by rusty strokes in the sky. My brother and I separate them by color. He pile pieces of dust together, mallard wings stacked with slender beads that interlock. We turn over the autumn-colored amoebas of a lost twilight, one by one. We begin to believe there is a true equation that rules the sky, orders even this musty corner of boredom and rain, the cracked plaster and briefs, briefs back of walls, that pleasure and pain can align, that if we could find the right formulas, step on no cracks, get this tongue into that groove, and collect the strokes of the clock to throw down like dice, then the melody would compose itself and slide into place. And the thousand pieces of water and sky would fit, and ring-neck mallards lift from the perpetual mist of the, mop, of the marsh. And all this might make some kind of sense. The clock taps patiently, a car door slants, the scales stop. Now we need more than the sky's wet algebra. 
more than even a stroke of luck. When I was a kid, my father used to introduce my mother as the bad locks. He took almost everyone, it didn't matter who it was. And in fact, I think he still occasionally does introduce her that way. And um, so that kind of gets into this poem. Um, I was going to take a swig out of this bottle, but I didn't figure out who's going to cool. <laughs> Um, oh, another thing that kind of triggered this poem was I was reading someone else's poem and uh, I can't remember who it was. I've been trying to think all day. I wish I could give credit, but um, it, was, it was a wonderful poem. But at some point, she was digging in the garden and she found a plastic, it was a little plastic man. It was a kid's play or a little soldiers or something. So my brother had cowboys and me and I think they had some soldiers too. And we used to play with those for hours and battles and that kind of thing. And I thought of those when I read her poem. And it just triggered this whole series of uh, images in my mind, which then led to this poem. And it's called Civil Wars. Father introduced her as Thor, the battle axe, the war department. <laughs> I'll have to ask the Sarge, he'd say. Lying from his false teeth. She said nothing, but we all knew his Cuban cigars, found skewered and barbecued, were no accident. <laughs> I watched them spin on the tisserie like fat fingers accusing the sky of unspeakable sins and me of silent collusion, which was the truth. I hid matches, switched water and gin, collaborated with an ever changing enemy. Lined up on checkered tile, plastic guns aimed at wall sockets and, so and cobwebs, my brother's little men took orders only from him until they went down, swept under a rug, or nicked and wounded later by washer blades. Battle sounds raged from his mouth and long caves of rifle fire. The red and yellow soldiers fell despite the names he gave them. Buck, Rip, and Mad Dog Miller. <laughs> Cross storm windows, clouds marched in wild formations, the sky darkened and hurled, and other voices joined the salvos, mothers cracking over fathers, accusing him of waking the dead. And I saw them, all the lost dead, headed for our den, some headless and blue, or sleepwalking pairs of pop eyed zombies. The pale cousin in her long nightgown, who fell from a hayrick into his heaven of swirling hay. And Uncle Brady, holding up a braid of trout, Confederate flag rippling on the arm he lost in Korea. My brother held them all off with his plastic platoon. But when Mother let loose and the geraniums flew in their own pots, dirt, blooms, and clay shards spattering like shrapnel, we knew it was time to retreat. I'd slip outside and fall into the safety net of constellations, hide in the network of a wide and speechless sky, my brother somewhere there in dark, dog growl and starlight, where a distant light would change a life, where the darkness and unknown are less feared than the known, where it's every child for herself. Um, this next poem was um, began with, I was thinking about Nancy Drew <laughs> for a while, but um, I used to be a Nancy Drew addict. I read every one of her books. I read a lot of mysteries when I was a kid. And um, a lot of this stuff got into this whole series of poems, because I watched Perry Mason too, Perry Mason addict. So some of that got into these, and Nancy Drew gets into these, and they just all get into stuff, and, and that gets into this poem. Um, kind of also has to do with like, something with the family secrets again, and the whole things that go on in this particular family, or, um, things that aren't talked about. I was fantasizing that um, in this family, if Nancy Drew came to spend the night, what would happen? <laughs> this girl in the family. 
And that's how this happens. You can't get it. Nancy Drew sleeps over. <laughs> Cedar, naughty pine conundrums, the night had its secrets. Mr. Drew said it's okay, I told my parents, and Nancy did the same. <laughs> Arrived at the vinyl overnight case, Noxima and baby doll pajamas. Then the whispering began. Who was kissed and murdered in the dark? Stories of old men who die and return to collect their bones. Then, wide awake, I watched Nancy Drew drop anchor in shallow, unruffled slumber of a girl detective who has nothing to fear. She slept undisturbed by night cries that could be wild geese, escaped to shadow the moon, or my brother. Pajamas down, the hot strop of leather sinking into his flesh, teaching him not to pee in his bed. Then the mundane drone of baseball scores and refrigerators. Nancy snored, the household dozed, and drifted on a sea of ordinary currents. Then morning sunlight, dripping the dregs of night. Fingerprints and clues everywhere. <laughs> there in the coffee grounds, in the spidery scripted names of the Bible's frontispiece, and Father's belt, the leather softer each time. Stepping briskly over clues, the girl smooth skims downstairs, straightens her tan, and she's off in Mr. Drew's shiny roadster <laughs> to investigate the clue of the double jinx mystery in the hidden staircase. The morning continues to strum a pale and different song on the maple coffee table, a half-finished crossword. What's a four-letter word for refusal to accept the truth? A page of checkmark long division and a bowl of glass grapes shot with sunlight. All the familiar household deceptions. I have a number of poems that have to do with dolls. In fact, I also have Kind of be, uh, you're not hearing me, but I love paintings and I have a series of uh, mannequin photographs too. And some some of the poems have mannequin pictures and uh, blog dolls and paper dolls and childhood dolls. I was reading an essay by Rilke, I think it's a really wonderful essay on dolls and their relationship to children. And thinking a lot about that and trying to figure out what this meant in my work. And I don't think I've completely figured it out, but it, has, it seems to me it has something to do with um, kind of serving the same purpose that dreams do in some way, just to sort of work things out. And I think I worked things out through dolls, or well, attempted to. I don't know if I worked them out always. But this poem, I, I wanted to write a poem about a doll hospital. And, um, I knew it had something to do with some of these, all these doll images that kept occurring and recurring. So um, that's the title of this poem, Doll Hospital. My sister was the responsible one. We brought her our tired, bag eared babies, unsprung sausage curls, eyes of scratched cobalt, where hopes and fears collected and reflected back. Pale and implacable, with peeing smiles, they waited for her touch. She twisted their necks backward, pressed crybaby hearts to her ear. She was Dr. Patient, pudgy fingers playing over a hinged and wacky leg. She raised a crumbling baby, cured it with herself with one touch to polyurethane. She sprayed Betsy Betsy's head silver once. Royal <laughs> crown of secret royalty, or luminous mark for aliens. Some streaked the dusty walls of her flimsy hospital, crucified the tile. Lucy and Desi spoke through her while she stitched an arm back on me. She moved from chart to chart, heart smooth, dispensing pastel pills, a sainted Nancy Drew who never solved the mystery. When they cried, manufactured tears spoiled satin bows and rusted their metal perforated hearts. Then she received them, one by one, in a white collar, in Perry Mason's gown. Seems twisted, Valentine lips unloosed a runaway train of confessions. Cigarettes on the slide, snitched bittersweet, what happened under the bed, all shapes and sizes of lies. In the blue veil of afternoon, 
Professor and sitter merged. She knelt on the cold, unforgiving tile, caught between the blink of her lucid baby moves and the fixed eyes of the lonely lady watching from her cool alcove, bewildered but always full of grace. Just have a couple more points. Um, in this one, uh, in this series also, I have people speaking. I have. Um, Different characters speaking from different viewpoints, so they each take a turn sort of to tell their story from their view. And I have also had a tree talking. And um, this poem I took kind of a risk, and I, I thought I wanted to try this. So it's a stuffed bear that talks in the poem, and it sort of tells things from his viewpoint. It's called The Bear Remembers. It was not easy, sitting up, stuffed and ready on the narrow bed, spread with rocket ships, diving at the silver-pitted moon. One eye dangled from a string, ears flopped like aviator flaps. My velvet-padded feet stroked down to nubs from your sucking and kneading. It was not easy, soaking up your tears, ringworm and flu, waiting for you in a blue rectangle where the wind tossed stars over a cold hardwood sea. And it was not easy, smelling a permanent wind and holding back, so aware of the tight stitches, the non-mortal seams, the uselessness of those stuffed paws, and watching as the cold knob turned and you fell out of yourself. It was not easy afterwards, either, when the bed shook for hours and then you were so limp I could hold you in the slack womb of manic fur. It's time now for a winter sun to set fire to that line of aspens. For the wind to dry your eyes, for one last story where the bow doesn't break and the north wind doesn't suck at our bare feet. There's time for one last snapshot, your cheek puffed down into a shoulder with lumps, hugging me tight, black dot eyes bright, as the fever that burned through your rocket ship pajamas and launched us straight into the fierce stars, breaking all the barriers of distance and sound. We used to play a game when I was a kid where you take, it's called statues, you take hold of somebody's hand and leg and throw them out over the lawn. And do that with each person and they have to hold this position until um, the first person who moves is the other kid. They chase me around or something. <laughs> I'm not sure exactly how it went, but I remember very vividly playing this game. And uh, this poem is came out of that. It's called Statues. Anchored by one wrist and ankle, we were spun and thrown over the long shadowed lawn. Grass stained and dizzy, we fell into grotesque postures, restless mannequins suspended in breathless light, desiring and fearing to be it. Now a small statue sits, lotus frozen inside, soaks up adult words, thirsty, for the crossed heart and king's ex of childhood. It never grows or goes away, reposing inside a knot of fears. It watches our dreams turn to salt, funneling away through the hourglass eye. Summer nights from the moon of newly mowing lawns rises up from the horizon and passes over shadows of birds. The statues of lost children pose, transparent and still, just beyond the corner of a dazzled eye. 